So hello, um, I'm Gavin Atkinson. Um, I'm part of the Floss UK Council, which is why I'm in this beautiful yellow t-shirt, but um, this talk is um, more about something that I personally am involved with as a hobby. Um, so FreeBSD, um, you've probably heard of, I'm guessing 90% of the people in the room are Linux users, probably more. Um, possibly one or two Solaris users, one or two. Um, so I thought I'd give a talk on FreeBSD because it's, it's, it's um, been described as the unknown giant of operating systems and I think that's probably quite a fair thing to say about it. Um, so I'll tell you who I am, what FreeBSD is, um, what the project is. I'll try and give you a bit of background as to how the project itself works, which will fit nicely with the um, keynote earlier, although I hadn't seen the keynote, it, it fits in nicely with it. Um, who uses FreeBSD and why? Um, first thing I'll say is I wrote this talk I, in Google Docs. I then went to make it look pretty, and Google did this. <laughs> so it decided transparent blue text was the right idea, and I thought that might get in the way of presenting. So I have a nice, boring black and white um, presentation. I hope that's OK. Some people might say this fits with FreeBSD quite well, because it's boring and whatever. I'm happy with that. So I have been involved since, well, I've been using FreeBSD since about 99. Um, but I've been involved quite heavily for quite a long time. So um, I started off with just submitting patches. Um, eventually, at a uh, UK UEG conference in 2009, um, got talking to a guy called Robert Watson, who was presenting in Manchester last time it was here. Um, and he got me involved uh, much more in that depth. Um, so in 2011, I was um, made a documentation committer, um, which means I can directly change documentation tree. And then in 2012, I'm um, oh, sorry, tw 2009, I was a source committer, so I can, you know, direct a commit access to the source. Um, in 2012, I was elected onto the FreeBSD core team, which is the sort of nine-person board of leadership, essentially, and I was re-elected in 2014. Um, I'm also part of the security team of FreeBSD, handling security reports, vulnerabilities, and things like that, and I'm also deal with uh, managing the actual physical cluster around the world, so our CDN, our uh, build machines, and things like that. So I should be able to answer any question you have. As I touched on there, I started around 99. Hello. Any questions? I must have misunderstood <laughs> because it, it seemed like you said you had access to commit to the source code before you could write any documentation. So we have, we have it in three trees. Um, there's three separate repositories, and the uh, access to those is um, handled separately. So I started out at university. Um, I actually was involved in the university radio station, and I'd emailed over the summer saying I want to be involved in the computing team. I got an email about a week later saying, yes, you are now the computing team. By the way, the last guy has left the university. Our server was rooted two weeks ago. It's your job now. <laughs> <laughs> now, at the time, I'd, my entire experience of Unix was basically I'd acquired an old SGI Indigo and I'd spent a week poking around with it, not really knowing what I was doing. So <laughs> it was time to hit the ground running, and I ended up with FreeBSD because it had the best documentation. And that's one of the reasons I've always been really involved in documentation and, and understand the sort of real value of it, because it's how I got into it. Um, so FreeBSD is not a Linux distribution. It's a separate kernel developed um, entirely unrelated to Linux. It's um, much closer to the original Unix. It's the, there's pretty much a solid line right back to 1970s um, Unix. Um, it's one of the most successful open source projects through both the number of commits, size of tree, number of people involved, um, length, 24 years of continuous history. We, are proud of that history. We go to a lot of effort to sort of maintain history. We've never, you can go back through 24 years of commits, one commit at a time. And then before that, when that tree was imported, you can go back to through commits right through to 1976. 
and we have that solid history there. Um, we have a focus on security, storage, networking, embedded. Um, those are our strengths in no real order. And there's many innovative features, some of which you'll know about, some of which you'll use every day, some of which you'll have never heard of. Um, it's an active developer community of about 400 people. That's across um, source, documentation, and people who port software to FreeBSD. Um, and it's all under the BSD license, which I'll come to later. Um, one thing with the BSD license is there's no requirement to give code back, which sounds like a bad thing, isn't necessarily. Uh, but that's the main difference between GPL. You can take some free BSD code or any stuff under the BSD license, stick it in your closed source application, and never have to do anything else. As I say, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, even though it might sound like it is to people who are used to the GPL and ideas. Um, it's an OS, it's a kernel, it's a user land. It's all developed as one. Um, the ports tree is maintained as well, which is, as I said, software ported to FreeBSD, so the vast majority of stuff doesn't need any real work. You know, things like GNOME might have some assumptions as to how Linux works that we need to tweak, but mostly software, especially if it's, you know, built with POSIX in mind, just works. <coughs> as I say, it's one of the most successful projects. And, um, it's used everywhere. You almost certainly don't know this, but you're using it for today. Um, root name servers, about a quarter of those are FreeBSD based. Um, major web hosts, search engines, Yandex in Russia, their Google, it's the biggest search engine that's not Google, is all FreeBSD based. Um, foundation for major operating systems, I can see so many Macs in this audience. Uh, um, but it's more than just software, um, it's a community. Oh. Developers, so sort of almost a hierarchy. Um, the core team um, provide leadership, provide direction. Um, committers are the people with direct access, there's 400-ish with direct access, and port maintainers similarly. Contributors, you can't count, there's, there's many, many thousands, and there's communities of users. Uh, user groups and things. Um, the foundation itself, so the FreeBSD Foundation works similar to some foundations and quite different to other foundations. Um, they're a non-profit entity to hold um, the intellectual property, legal things, so own the domain, own the trademarks, um, raise funds, provides a, an entity for money to go through if you know, whatever, sponsor events, sponsor conferences, sponsor people to go to those conferences, buy hardware for the cluster, um, provide somebody to sign non-disclosure agreements and negotiate um, research and development. So if, if a company wants to fund some work and another company wants to fund the other half of that work, they provide the legal ability to do that, <sighs> things like that. Um, the project produces everything. Um, FreeBSD, that's the project. Um, we produce the kernel, the user space, the ports collection releases, <coughs> all the documentation, the website. It's all done as one, essentially. Touching on the sort of conversations from earlier, I thought I'd leave these slides in. Um, 220 source committers across the world. Um, I thought I'd drop some stats in. I actually did these stats four years ago and I've redone them today and they're basically about the same. So I think we're succeeding on the replacing new people at the bottom that was talked about in the talk this morning. Um, a lot of the new people come in from things like Google Summer of Code, which if you've not been involved in Google Summer of Code, if you've not heard of it, if you know students who are interested in doing open source development over summer, tell them about Summer of Code because it's a superb project. Um, Google will fund a student to pay uh, for coding over a summer. Um, distribution. Um, when people want to be involved in FreeBSD, we try to mentor people well. So um, the our people will submit changes um, when when they're obviously very 
you know, submitting a lot of changes or submitting really good quality stuff or they're just submitting it too so fast that we can't keep up. Um, or for whatever other reason, um, you know, we push them towards being a committer, um, but we too try to mentor them strongly. So all the initial changes will be mentored. They'll, they'll have educate, you know, educated in uh, style, in how to fit in, um, things like that. Making sure that we're not going to um, bring somebody into the community who turns out to be toxic, who turns out to be, you know, pu pushing other users away, or that sort of person. Um, in a project the size of this, it's actually quite hard to make sure you don't end up with, with people who um, upset other people, I guess. And part of the mentoring process is to make sure that we, we don't fall into that trap or anything like that. Again, um, that's the rough distribution. So we've got source committers, roughly the same sort of number of port committers and then documentation committers, but quite a lot of people, myself included, split into two. It, it, you know, have multiple uh, thing access rights, so just a more amount of interest than anything. So the core team's an elected body. Um, we provide leadership. We provide um, approval for new source committers, um, direction, talking to companies, talking to people using um, FreeBSD to get a feel for how they're using it and what would be useful. Um, the, the unpleasant part, unfortunately, dealing with rules, conflict resolution, enforcement, violation of the code of conduct, things like that. That's, that's, that's the least nice part of being on the core team. That's the bit that takes up a lot of time. Um, it has to happen. Somebody has to do it and it falls to the core team. Generally, these things will be policed in the community. If all else fails, the core team, so they're the last p set of people who um, will deal with that. Um, I was talking about ports. So again, so, 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 you know, people don't write GNOME or KDE with FreeBSD in mind, necessarily. Um, we have people who will make sure that it works well on FreeBSD. So there's rough stats, so 200 or 200 people who have access to the tree, um, 1,800 people who are named as maintainers for particular ports, and we've got about 27,000 ports right now. Um, pretty much every piece of software you can name will be in there. Again, there's, there's, there's when people maintain ports and submit sufficient numbers of changes or whatever, they, you know, we, will, we will encourage them to become committers. That's an old diagram. I actually couldn't find a new one, but just as a rough sort of feel for how you can tell how old it is, because we haven't used CVS for 15 years. Um, but the layout's roughly the same. So the core team and the foundation work together. Um, the, the, neither have control over the other. We both sort of try and manage our own separate areas and um, jointly lead kind of thing. So as I say, uh, it's described as the unknown giant. Um, it's becoming less and less unknown, it has to be said. Um, we have a lot of people doing a lot of shifting of data with it. Um, list of companies you'll have heard of who were massively doing it. So Netflix basically stream all of their video from FreeBSD now. Um, NASA are doing 100 gigabit firewalling with FreeBSD because that's they've found that that's the only way they can do it. Um, Yandex I've mentioned is Russia's equivalent to Google. Um, Orange, especially the Orange.fr um, entire network is FreeBSD. Um, other companies, PFSense, Monowall, and FreeNAS. You've likely heard of all three. You probably use one or two of them. Um, FreeBSD best. FreeBSD is used a lot in embedded stuff as well. Um, I've mentioned that Apple, obviously OS X is FreeBSD based. Juniper, all of their routers are FreeBSD based. Um, Cisco, Dell, Dell's, um, a lot of their appliances are. Um, Isilon and NetApp, two file store, NAS vendors, and Panasus as well. Um, it's everywhere. I'm just going to touch on Netflix. Well, I'm going to touch on three just because I find them fascinating. So Netflix, 
um, serve their data, all the, all the video data comes from FreeBSD, and they basically ship appliances that sit in the ISP to, so that it's nice and close to um, the actual consumers. Um, they are currently feeding from single CPU boxes just under 90 gigabits of encrypted on the fly traffic from single FreeBSD machine. Um, they count for about 30, 35, 37% of the entire US traffic at peak. It's <coughs> a lot of bandwidth. Um, FIS Global use FreeBSD, so they, you will never have heard of them. They produce huge machines sort of the size of this room for the banking industry, where you basically empty entire mail sacks of posting at one end, and it goes through it opens the envelope, it scans the checks, it does all the OCR on the check, it does the account stuff, and out the other end pops shredded data, uh, shredded paperwork. Um, I have, I, there is a video of their hardware doing this, it's fascinating, I can't find it. WhatsApp, they're shifting millions and millions of messages a day, all that's FreeBSD and Erlang based. Um, they send one, uh, 42 billion messages a day which is comparable to Twitter's 200 billion tweets per year. I can't even comprehend 42 billion messages a day. Um, I can't find a more up-to-date stat on that, but they were doing 3 million. I believe it's near a 7 million right now. It's used in research as well. So Cambridge are doing um, an open source MIPS-based CPU called Berry. And then they're doing research with this open source MIPS CPU called Cherry, which is a capabilities CPU. So it actually tags every bit of data with capabilities and they're basing the entire thing on FreeBSD because that way they can ship, at the end of the day, they can ship the BSD licensed CPU and a BSD licensed OS on hardware you can just buy off the shelf. Sony's PlayStation runs FreeBSD. It's actually twice. There's it runs it as the main OS and it runs it in an embedded in the south bridge of the thing. So that when, this, when the main machine switched off, FreeBSD is still doing the background downloading and stuff like that, which is quite interesting. Um, Nintendo, um, we found out last week that the Nintendo Switch is FreeBSD based. Um, we had no idea until it was actually released and somebody found it in the copyright notices. Um, the Japanese um, games console manufacturers, as you can probably imagine, are very, very secretive about what goes into them. Um, so this was a total surprise to everyone, but we're trying to um, talk to Nintendo at the moment about being more involved in the community. Um, Sony are pretty well, pretty much involved. They do a lot of contribution back to both FreeBSD and other open source projects they use. Um, Nothing unexpected on there. Um, I think it's great. You should too. Um, the BSD license I touched on, that is its entirety. 190 words versus 5,600 for the GPL. Lawyers love this. You can read it in an afternoon. You can read it in 10 minutes and still understand it and have plenty of time for coffee. Um, I like the GPL. I do have some software I write under the GPL. Um, but this is one of the reasons why lots of people use FreeBSD in embedded situations. It's easy, you, you, don't have to re, uh, you don't have to open source any of your software, there's no risk of ever having to do that. People like that. Um, and we've actually gained a lot of users over the GPL v3. Um, various companies, when, when v3 came out, they, they've just said, no, we're not allowing any of this it through the door. It's too risky. Um, and we've gained quite a lot of users from that point of view. Um, what time am I on? We, are, we currently use some GPL v2 code in the tree. So we have GCC for um, platforms which are not as common. So Spark 64, I think, is uh, GCC still. Uh, but we're working on removing all the GPL code. There's half a dozen things left and we're expecting to do it within the year, I would think. Still looking good for that. Um, GPL 2 and 3? We have no GPL 3 in the tree at all. 
Um, this is to remove the GPL2. So, Jack, when you say you're digging it from the tree, is that the kernel tree or is that the whole. So, the land? kernel and user land is the same tree. Right. It's from not in there at all. Um, we're still happy to use it for things like building documentation and stuff that isn't necessary. Um, obviously, it's still absolutely fine in the ports tree because a lot of applications that people want to use are GPL3. But you can take the kernel, the entire user land, stick it on a disk, and it will not have any GPL code in there. Or by then, by previous C12. Just do it. It'll work. No? No. So the, the user land on the kernel are GPL v3, uh, GPL3. Um, any third-party applications, yeah, just install them. That's fine. But we're shipping. No, in the base system with no GPL, in, in the port tree, which is third-party stuff, you can have whatever you want because they can't really say, well, oh, you don't have that, or no, we'll use the yeah. base system. So the, the, the port tree contains a multitude of licenses. It, it contains things like the Microsoft X fat stuff. You actually need a license from Microsoft to use, and nasty things like that, right through to... Um, you know, public domain software. We don't care what the license is on that. If somebody's using software from the ports tree <coughs> in a context where it matters, then they need to be worried about that. The, well, I'm talking purely about base system here. Um, yeah, the license <laughs> permits closed source derivatives. Um, this makes people happy because they can, um, there's no <laughs> risk that they'll end up with a kernel module that they have to open source because of the GPL, um, even though you know it contains their secret stuff. Um, again, the, there's, there's, that's quite an advantage in the US banking industry, where there's some stuff which you have to keep secret. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that based on FreeBSD just because they don't want to risk it. Now, again, so GPL versus BSD is, is very ideological. Um, I, as I say, I use both. I'm happy with both. I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. That would be a, a stupid conversation to get into. Um, <laughs> but that's why people are using it. Um, the LLVM compiler we use, <coughs> GP, uh, the GCC uh, runtime exception um, has some nasty clause in it called the eligible compilation process, which scares people off. So. LLVM's mostly been developed by Apple because they wanted to avoid the stuff related to the eligible compilation process with, for what they do with the graphics cards. Um, device drivers developed under FreeBSD, so we've got people like NVIDIA. The NVIDIA driver that you use on Linux was actually developed on FreeBSD so that no one can ever turn around to NVIDIA and say, you need to open source this because it's GPL based, because they can prove no, we developed on FreeBSD and then created a shim for Linux. So it's an interesting use. Um, we've had a lot of people come to FreeBSD recently um, and less recently. Um, Solaris and Sun being bought by Oracle did us a lot of favours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. That, 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 yeah, we. I mean, admittedly, this was four years ago, five years ago now, but, but there was a huge uptake in, in people using it. Uh, people with multi-terabyte ZFS arrays found they could just boot FreeBSD and all their data was still there and accessible. Um, we also imported DTrace many years ago from Open Solaris, and it's a beautiful thing. And once you've used it on Solaris, you just can't stop using it. It's, it's, it lets you sort of interrogate system stuff. So if you're trying to investigate performance, it's, it's the first tool to use. And we don't use systemd, which has brought a lot more people recently to us. Um, again, I'm indifferent about systemd. I don't like it as a concept. I don't mind it in a sort of, it doesn't get in the way of my life, but Certainly, some people have been quite vocal about not liking system day. I don't think it fits the Unix philosophy of, you know, small things doing simple jobs. I quite like text file journals. I quite like. It just shouldn't run its own DNS server. <laughs> <laughs> no, in its grip, should run a DNS server. 
Um, sorry? Well, so we just have the standard yeah. libc resolver. Um, uh, we, well, we actually ship uh, unbound if you want to do DNS sec, and it's just an enableable default in the installer. Um, yeah. Um, I was, I included the first bit because I thought it might get people arguing. Um, it's an interesting thing to say. It's not something that I think everyone will agree with. Um, it's under certain workloads, FreeBSD is much more stable than Linux. Under certain workloads, I'm sure Linux is much more stable than FreeBSD. Um, Yahoo use FreeBSD extensively because for their workload, FreeBSD wins. Um, again, it's, it's very subjective and I'm quite happy to accept that that's the case. Um, this is undeniable. Our UDP stack is massively faster than, than Linux, um, which is why certain large companies use memcached and they basically their entire state's Linux with the exception of their memcached farm because they can get massive amount more data through it. Um, it's also why the root, a lot of the root servers use FreeBSD. Um, we've got a lot of interesting technologies. Um, vImage lets you entirely virtualize the network stacks. You can have a thousand or a million virtual network stacks on one machine um, talking to jails which are a very lightweight um, virtualization. Um, Netmap is PF ring kind of um, for Linux people. Beehive is our hypervisor. Um, it's tiny. It does full uh, hypervised hyper virtualization. Um, we can emulate Linux if you ever need to actually. The very first patch I ever submitted was to the Linux simulation stuff. This will date me slightly. It was to the real audio, real producer software to get that working. So, um, NetGraph is a pluggable network infrastructure, so you can uh, just you know plug modules together and create an entire path for packets to go through. Um, high availability storage, multiple servers with the same image, with the same disks shared. Um, OpenPAM, you'll probably use quite a lot of Linux distributions, use OpenPAM as well. OpenBSM is shared between FreeBSD and OSX uses that now as well, which is um, audit framework and things like that. Yep. Just to check, when you say OpenPAM, you're talking about the plug of Yes. Part. Yes, that's originated on FreeBSD. Uh, Capsicum is a way of dropping writes for processes so um, you can harden a process you can say from this point on it this process cannot open new files or whatever and um, that came out of research at Cambridge and is now being taken up by Apple um, for the next version of OSX as well or oh, not OSX anymore is it um, we have tier one support for virtualization on Azure, Gandhi Cloud, VMware, etc. That means if you are using FreeBSD on Azure, you pick up the phone to Microsoft with a problem, the person you speak to knows about FreeBSD. Um, that Microsoft are massively invested in this, uh, which is great as well. It, support for it on AWS, Google Compute as well. Um, it will just work anywhere you want. Um, within the tree, many Div uh, many vendors support their own drivers, so Broadcom have two or three people who are committing to their network drivers, Intel the same. Microsoft, all of their uh, virtualization drivers, they maintain themselves. Um, PBSD works pretty much everywhere you can imagine from embedded on our MIPS and PowerPC or our strong points. Um, yeah. If you've got an embedded board, feel free to try FreeBSD. You'll probably be quite pleasantly surprised. I like FreeBSD. Um, I like it because the code is nice. It's, again, it's an incredibly subjective thing to say, but the code feels clean. The code feels... Sometimes you look at C code and you think, this was written by somebody who didn't know how to write C. And some bits of every 
um, project, I think, have that problem. Um, FreeBSD has, <coughs> from day one in 1970-whatever it was, had a style guide, and every line of code has been written to that style guide. And that just means that the entire kernel and, to a lesser extent, admittedly, the user land is all the same style, and it just makes it much more joyous and easy to work with. Um, we have an open development process. Basically, the only mailing list which is not public is the core mailing list. Um, everything else is done on mailing lists. Everything else, you know, all discussion happens on mailing lists. Reviews happen on Fabricator. Um, our bug database is entirely open. So I should say the security, uh, security team list is also private for obvious reasons. Um, there's always a strong desire to fix and not replace software. Um, so this is less of a problem these days on Linux, admittedly, but it certainly used to be sort of, you know, three or four different versions of DevFS because somebody came along, didn't like what was there, and rewrote a new one from scratch rather than making it better. And we, we, there's much less of a desire to do that. There's much less of a desire to, I guess, get your name in lights as opposed to get a working OS. Um, and obviously, there's the integration between everything, which means that it's a much, it feels like it's been built as one. Um, I've put straightforward configuration in there because I, I fancied making, um, I will come to the straightforward configuration next. And the other thing I like about FreeBSD, I, if you've ever read this, excellent. If you haven't, read it. Um, it's a superb um, description, by, actually by a guy called from Microsoft, um, about how operating system developers work and how, you know, you when you're working in the kernel, you get one chance to do it right. If not, you have to reboot kind of thing. And there's a superb quote from it. I have no tools because I've destroyed my tools with my tools. Read the thing. Uh, if there's one thing you take away from this, even if you don't try FreeBSD, go away and read that PDF for me. There's a lot of myths about FreeBSD. Um, I've picked three random ones. Um, people seem to have this belief that you have to compile things. That's not been true for 15 years. Um, the OS binary updates are there. Um, we had an, the old package manager wasn't great, but it worked. The new package manager has been in place since 2012 and is much nicer. Um, it's probably still lagging behind apt in some ways, but I, I, I don't think it's. I think it, it's certainly a much better improvement, and I think yeah, it's fine. Um, Hardware support, people again think, you know, oh, this laptop was built in the last five years, it won't work. Um, that's not true. Um, sometimes we have support in front of Linux, sometimes behind, often, especially for things like it, um, Intel chipsets, it's the same bit of code that Intel have produced that's running in both OSs. Um, and for some reason, people don't think we've got Wi Fi. We have, it works, it's great. Um, I thought I'd just troll a little bit. Um, again, we try and have a nice unified sort of approach to things, a nice sort of easy way of configuring. If you want to configure a, a network adapter, whether it's wired or wireless, it's the same command. You know, if you want to look at the duplex setting of an existing one, it's the same command. If it's a network thing, it's the same command. Admittedly, this is an odd one out, but that's, that was decided before I was born. Um, I'm going to skip the next two slides because they are trolling, but yeah, files distributed everywhere versus FreeBSD, which just has a single um, thing where all the sort of OS config is set. That's pretty much it. I'm going to leave lots of time for questions, and hopefully you've got lots of questions. I'll take them on anything. Um, but big project, um, thousands of contributors, millions of lines of code. It's everywhere. You probably don't realize just how often you use it. I suspect every single one of you is running it in your pocket in some way right now, at least code derived from FreeBSD on your phone. Um, <coughs> yeah, have a go, please. I think that's it, yeah.
Thank you. I have seven minutes for questions, apparently. Hello. Oh, it'll just work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Where should I start? Yeah, VMware, VirtualBox are both absolutely fine. Both of them um, support FreeBSD fully. Uh, it's it's a tier one platform on VMware, so you know if you have problems and if something doesn't work, VMware will fix it. Um, yeah, or on an old laptop or whatever if you've got it. Um, you. For a bog standard machine, you don't need much memory at all. I mean, you could even install on something with like 256 meg and get a feel for it. We'll, we'll quite happy when on 32 meg uh, MIPS routers. So, yeah, admittedly, 32 meg's tight, but yeah, you, you can try it wherever you want. Paul. Why do you think, the on block? And yet it seems to have basically won in terms of you know, who supports it. There's a lot of people who support VSD, but a lot of them have not heard of unless you're in the industry. Mm. Whereas Linux, I can mention Linux to a sort of ordinary person in the street, actually. Yeah. They've kind yes. of heard of it. There's all these companies, you know, people like Ubuntu, it's all just works really nice. <coughs> kind of, and free BSD seems to have some sort of technical superiority. <coughs> it seems to be really bad at marketing. Yes. Uh, yeah, and there's, I mean, there's a lot more money behind Linux right now, and therefore there's a lot more marketing. There's people like Red Hat whose entire job is to sell you boxes, and we don't really have a Red Hat equivalent to FreeBSD. Um, so, as a result, yes, the marketing suffers quite a bit considerably. Um, there were there was a lawsuit back in '93, that, which is infamous, which sort of massively held FreeBSD back just at the time Linux was taking off. So right back in 93, you know, at that point you either had the risk of FreeBSD or the unknown risk of Linux and lawyers like prefer unknown risk to known risk, I think, when, it, when the known risk is we might need to switch this off. Um, it's changing now uh, a bit. Linux is always going to be the bigger name, I think. Um, I can't see that changing anytime soon. Um, but when we've got people like Netflix shouting from the rooftops about how FreeBSD is doing so well for them, and, and you know when they're pushing 90 gigabits of data, and they're you, the, the commenting on blog posts from the BBC where they're proud of getting 15 gigabits out of one of their Linux boxes, it's quite amusing. Um, but I think it's. I don't know, yeah, marketing is something we're not doing well. And that's all server side stuff as well, that, that Netflix side, like really interesting perspective, but it's mm. you, if you do it technically, as a normal person, so I can't have it on my laptop. Yeah. I know the answer is yes, but... And, and, and that's the problem, so, so from, an, from an end user point of view, if you just have a desktop, it probably doesn't matter what you're running underneath it. If you're just running Apache, you probably don't care again. Um, and. That makes it quite a hard sell because if, if you're not pushing massive amounts of data, then it doesn't matter what you do. Um, so why wouldn't you go with what you already know? Um, uh, it, it's a hard problem to solve, and I don't really have an answer to that. Did someone else have their hand up? Yep. Um, where do you see your relationship with um, the other BSD? We have a good uh, relationship. It, it, it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, so going back 10, 15 years, there was passionate hatred through to strong distrust, somewhere between. Um, these days, I mean, so there's, there's three or four huge conferences each year, and they're all joint. Um, there's a lot of code sharing between. There's a lot of um, involvement between. So for example, Summer of Code, um, this year, FreeBSD and NetBSD have got in. OpenBSD didn't, but we'll be saying to them, "Look, if you, you know, want to ha mentor somebody for something that is jointly useful for both of us, then that's cool." There's, there's, there's a lot more interaction. I mean, we're all working towards different goals, and we're all working towards different um, beliefs as to how the world should look. And in some ways, that means there's no people. You're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, 
but generally, and, and we have lots of people who are involved in multiple projects as well. So there's people who are both FreeBSD and NetBSD and indeed OpenBSD developers. There's a lot of um, drivers shared, so some of our Wi-Fi drivers come from OpenBSD and vice versa. Yeah, we're quite friendly. Any, did you? No, is that any, any more? Yep. Do you ever actually have them, the manufacturers come to essentially, how do they approach when they, because they're obviously using a lot of FreeBSD, do they just work it out themselves? Do many of them <coughs> come over and say, ah, how do I do this? Because they're either making something new or they've broken something. Um, so what? So vendors <coughs> producing say, a network card? Are we yeah, talking about? So, or? Say for example, Netflix went ahead and was like, well, "We're going to make a new server with it," and they want to do something new or completely break it. Who do they go to? Do they develop it themselves? Do they go to the a bit of each? Um, so Netflix, um, they're mostly using stock FreeBSD. They've done some work on bits of uh, locking and things, <coughs> especially on the inbound. Um, TCP acknowledge path, I think, was actually one of their big bottlenecks. Um, so they've done the development work on that, but mostly people it's, it just work with the community. You know, If you've got something that occasionally crashes when you poke it in a particular way, they'll open a bug report and the person responsible will see it and fix it eventually. Um, or <coughs> people work on it themselves, again, because it's an open kernel and, and nice code to use and nice an easy code to get used to I think it's it's sometimes easier to find the sort of code paths than it is in other um, OS's as well so it's it's quite easy and, so and simply put most of the time they don't have to come to anyone because it just works <laughs> <sighs> yeah let's let's go with that it's not true necessarily <laughs> but but yeah um, and I think when it doesn't it's quite easy to either get somebody to fix it or understand the code yourself to fix it. Yes? So I was going to say, uh, obviously going from Linux world, there's a wealth of choice to discourage Mac, or to assault, puppet check, et cetera. What was the thought on um, free BSE like with common great Mac? Everything works. Um, yeah. I, I, so as far as I'm aware, <laughs> we're, we're in exactly the same place with pretty much all of those. Um, I don't have much experience with Chef. Um, I know Puppet pretty much is identical from a... You, you kind of hit the problems where, like, FreeBSD names Apache uh, something else to what Ubuntu does, but then you have the same problem with Ubuntu and Red Hat. So I think, I think from, from a configuration management point of view, you could probably just think of it as another Linux distribution rather than anything. Tools that add users will just work on both and things like that. Oh, I've been told it's lunchtime. Thank you. If anyone wants to talk to me afterwards, feel free, but I am quite hungry as well. <laughs> <laughs>